As Washington, D.C.'s central library, the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Library serves D.C. residents from every neighborhood and culture in our city, with offerings ranging from maker's labs to town halls. Before working to concerts, we go well beyond books. Here, artists and activists, teachers and learners, toddlers and seniors converge to explore our city's past and the infinite potential of its future. Because the MLK Library is not only a place to be quiet, it is a place to be heard, to be understood. It is a place to explore the possibility of all we can be. And it is a place to just be. Welcome to the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Library, celebrating 50 years as Washington, D.C.'s first memorial to Dr. King. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Library, Mies van der Rohe's only building in Washington, D.C., and his only realized library in the world. I am Richard Reyes Gavilan, the executive director of the D.C. Public Library. Um, this building underwent a $211 million renovation between 2017 and 2020, in which we prioritized respecting the building's historic designation keeping all things Mies while making the necessary interventions to make it relevant and joyful for a new generation of library users. Many of you in the audience this evening were instrumental in that successful endeavor, so give yourselves a quick pat on the back and let's, uh, let's move on. Since the library reopened in September 2020, it has won numerous awards, including the Richard H. Driehaus National Preservation Award, which is administered by the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And most recently, and most fittingly perhaps, just this month, the 2022 American Institute of Architects American Library Association Award for Excellence in Architectural Design. Yeah, we can. Thank you, Peter, who works for us. Um, <laughs> throughout 2022, we are celebrating the building's 50th anniversary and I cannot conceive of a better way to celebrate than by welcoming architect Dirk Lohan, Mises' grandson, to the MLK Library to share his reminiscences of his grandfather, discuss his own work, and discuss, frankly, uh, whatever he wants, because I am here for it. I am really here for it. You could talk about anything. Um, as some of you know, in the 1960s, Mr. Lohan worked with Mies on some of his most iconic buildings, including the New National Gallery in Berlin, the IBM building and plaza in Chicago, and the TD Center in Toronto. His own impressive portfolio includes the former McDonald's corporate headquarters, the Shed Oceanarium, and the Soldier Field stadium expansion and renovation. Before I turn it over to Dirk, I want to recognize and thank Mary Fitch, AIA DC Executive Director, and David Hensler for offering the DC Public Library the opportunity to host this special event. Thanks to Scott Clowney, AIA DC Director of Exhibitions and Public Programs, and Cynthia Vranis Olson, Director of the Mies van der Rohe Society, for their help. With that, please join me in welcoming Dirk Lohan. Thank you. Well, good evening. It's indeed a pleasure to be in Washington once again. I've been here numerous times over the years, but not in recent years very much. And um, to see this renovated building, it's, uh, I'm touched by it. It's a, it's a very great asset for your city. And I have the impression, at least with this crowd, that um, it is appreciated. Um, this, my little talk here, it came about in, in an in a, in a indirect, strange way. I, uh, in the 60s, towards the end of Mises' life, uh, I, uh, I spent one day a week, one evening a week, Thursday evenings, with him. And we had dinner. And, you know, he, he smoked Havana cigars and he drank martinis. And that's one of the 
the bad things I learned from him. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we talked about his life. He told me the story of his beginnings and his year, 30 years in Berlin and his coming to America and the beginning of his career in Chicago doing the war. Um, at one point, every evening after these long talks, I thought I should go home and write this all down, what I heard. But, you know, given the martinis, I couldn't, didn't have the, I didn't have the strength to do that. So I came up with a brilliant idea to get a tape recorder and put it on the table between him and me uh, in these, on these evenings, and I recorded the stories. And I asked questions very broadly in a chronological way from the beginning, and, but, but it wasn't very structured at all. And uh, I, then, however, I, we never got very far in his life, but and he died in 1969. And um, I donated these tapes, I don't know, maybe 1972, uh, to the Museum of Modern Art. And they were transcribed, and I more or less forgot about them. But last year, some publisher in Berlin, Germany, came out of the blue with a historian that has written about Mies repeatedly, um, Fritz Neumeyer, and they published this little book in both languages, uh, English and German. Um, uh, and it's called The Lohan Tapes from 1969. That was never my idea that there would be a book about the tapes, but um, it obviously in Chicago there's an interest in Mies and um, uh, the Arts Club, which is also a club where he was a longtime member, and I've been a member now for 50 years. Uh, and he did did some of the original club building work. Um, they uh, they invited me. Uh, to, instigated probably by Cynthia Branas from, uh, from the Mies Society uh, to give a talk and talk about this, this thing. And lo and behold, there was a visitor from Washington in the audience, um, David Hensler, who's sitting up here. And um, he apparently liked what he heard and <laughs> he decided I should do the same thing in Washington, D.C. So that's why I'm here. Um, I, I'd like to, uh, well, you know, this is, uh, I wish it was, but it's not a real martini. <laughs> <laughs> but it, just looking at it, inspire, it inspires me and reminds me of my grandfather, because he was really a good martini drinker, meaning several of them one, one evening, uh, and he never got drunk. I don't know how he did it, but he was a pretty substantial man and a strong figure. And um, uh, he smoked one cigar after another and used the, um, the uh, cigar as a, as a tool to gain a little time to answer a question and think about what to say. Uh, so he would puff on his cigar before he uh, 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 phrased his answer. So let's, let's talk, uh, who, who is the lady? Yeah, there we go. I have a, a collection of slides that I'd like to go through and I hope I can keep the time. Um, uh, and I begin with his work, his life, and gradually then uh, uh, end up showing you the transition from his career to my career and um, what I have done in, in the last uh, 50 years since he died. Um, this is the, his birth house in, in Aachen, 
Germany. Germ uh, Aachen is a town, an ancient historical town with a wonderful cathedral in it um, on the Dutch border, directly on the border. Uh, you, uh, this, from this house, a few hundred yards, you walk down the street and there's the border to Holland. So people, people there and even Mises family, they all spoke some Dutch. And uh, the border before World War I was a fluid border. It wasn't very strict. Um, and I know that he, when he came to visit later in the, after World War II uh, to Germany a few times to visit his old town, he loved to go across to, to Holland. There was a resort that he had known and he spent some time there regularly, Gulpen. Anyway, um, that means next slide. <laughs> <laughs> It's very hard for me even to see what I'm looking at. Oh, the parents, yes, I'm sorry. Um, the, uh, this is uh, father and mother, my great-grandparents. And uh, his father had a stonemason shop, a business, a small business in Aachen, and uh, worked on uh, the cathedral on some of the classical buildings that existed there and of course on cemetery stones etc and uh, Mies being the second son uh, after his older brother uh, he would have to seek a future outside that because it was tradition that the firstborn would take over the business of the father or the yeah and uh, uh, his, his older brother, with whom he had a very good, wonderful relationship uh, all his life, even to, to their death, um, uh, was, uh, was a, a eminent and, and very serious craftsman. And one of the stories that I find very touching, and you will enjoy, is uh, when Mies had already gone to Berlin from Aachen to, to work in other architects' practices and learn uh, the, the profession. Uh, um, he came back to visit his parents one day and his older brother was there. And the older brother was already sort of the, the businessman of the, the practice. And he said to his father, well, you know, this new job which came in, came in recently, we, we, we spent too much time on it, we should do it faster, it goes on top of a building, nobody will see it, <laughs> uh, what, what was done. And his father said, oh, no, 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 think about the Cologne Cathedral and the finials on those two spires on top of the building. That was made, they are made for God, it doesn't matter who how the humans don't have to see all the details. And I know this left a deep impression on Mies because he loved to say the quote, and he was famous for it, God is in the details. You all heard the opposite, the devil is in the details, right? <laughs> so it depends your, where you come from, <laughs> how you interpret that. But um, it was uh, in, in the practice in Chicago, we all, young architects, we all had heard about this saying and it had a deep impression on us that you do what you do to be perfect and don't cut the corners. And uh, that is, I would think, one of the aspects of how he was raised and what influenced him. It's, uh, it's also interesting to see those uh, two great-grandparents, they look so distinguished, uh, like bourgeois uh, people, you know, and they were. A little business, uh, he had suits and a gold watch, you see the chain, and the mother has a very might be done in, in silk, I don't know, but it's, uh, it's uh, impressive. Next. What 
Oh, yeah. Um, his mother, uh, the family was Catholic, uh, it took him to, uh, to the cathedral. The cathedral was uh, an ancient, the, the first part of the cathedral was an ancient um, Romanesque octagonal space. And you see a picture here. The, um, the columns were built of big stones and piled on top and the arches were built in a certain way. And the niece told me um, that his mother took him along. He was a choir boy. He didn't sing very much, in my opinion, ever. But um, he sat uh, doing the services there and looked at the stonework and studied it and asked himself how they did it and learned by watching the walls of the old Romanesque uh, church. Later in the mid mid Middle Ages, medieval times, uh, a Gothic addition was added, and uh, you all have heard of Charlemagne, the, uh, uh, the leader of the Holy Roman Empire, European Empire. Aachen was the capital of, that, of Europe at that time. So it's a very, Euro traditionally, a very European city, um, even though it's located in, in, in Germany. That's the Cologne Cathedral, that the Finials on top, and it's probably the greatest example of Gothic architecture in, in Germany, certainly uh, inspired and emulating some of the French cathedrals. Um, but Mies, as a young man, uh, instead of going to, uh, to the university and, and having a higher education, he basically learned the trade of building buildings and uh, drafting, drawing. And it became evident early on that he was talented in making drawings. And uh, he was, even at the very end of his life, uh, they taught him the various historical styles of, of, of decoration on walls and ceilings. And he said, I can still with my left hand behind my back draw a Louis XIV Cartouche for the ceiling. <laughs> you know, that, that, that's what he grew up doing and learning. And um, is also what he rejected later <laughs> in life, <laughs> interestingly. He didn't want to put these the, uh, moldings on walls and so on as a modernist. But the early years of his life were dominated with more traditional buildings, houses, and villas. And when he was, had just gone to Berlin and worked at Bruno Paul's office, which was one of the teachers, another one was uh, Peter Behrens, who was a leading architect in, in Germany at the time. He did a lot of work for the electrical company, the big electrical company. Um, and uh, interestingly, also uh, at Behrens' office at the time, Corbusier from France uh, was, was there for a while, and uh, Gropius, the, the founder of the Bauhaus. They all, they all worked in the Baron's office and got to know each other. So there, there's a connection that starts early on. Um, the, uh, you can go to the next slide. Oh, that's the... I really have trouble seeing what I'm saying. Oh, okay. Uh, that's the, the Berlin uh, Schinkel Building, uh, Altes Museum. Uh, that was made a great impression on him, of course. The, uh, Schinkel was one of the masters he admired very much in Berlin, and he used to take walks through the city as a young man to study the, how, how the corners were developed and how the stones were put together and so on and so on. So he was very familiar with the traditional classical styles. And in the early uh, uh, years of his life, he built um, a good number of villas outside the, in the perimeter or the suburb. This wasn't really, yeah, in, at, the, at the perimeter of Berlin, 
uh, in the Potsdam area where the, the royal castle was um, that uh, are famous now, even though they're not the modern Nice at all, but they were very well done. This, what you see now, the image is uh, Peter Behrens's um, AEG, the uh, Allgemeine Elektrizität, uh, Electricity Company in Germany. It's a big uh, turbine hall where they built turbines. And uh, that's an industrial building, one big span across, all glazed in with, so daylight for, for better viewing of the details. Uh, was created there. So this is actually a very modern, this could be built just the same way today and would make sense. But uh, it was done uh, before World War I. And when I one day uh, later, uh, we traveled to Berlin uh, and uh, I drove by there and I wanted to see some of the, the buildings that he worked on as a young man and he, uh, he still remembered exactly some of the dimensions from column to column. And I can tell you, he wouldn't know what the dimension from column to column is in this building. Because, uh, you know, you forget these things when you build many buildings. But on one of the first few buildings of your life, you remember these things. And I have the same experience now. I, I remember my first one or two buildings precisely. Um, and... Uh, the, uh, the I, I want to show you some of the villas. This is, I think, the real house. In uh, is it is that it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. When he worked at Bruno Paul, I mentioned him before. Um, a professor of philosophy of the university and his wife came to Bruno Paul and said, "We would like to have a house built. Would would you?" Do you have somebody that can do this? And Bruno Paul said, yeah, there's a young man here that knows how to build something. Um, but he was 21 years old. Um, and lo and behold, they interviewed him. And this philosophy professor must have realized that Mies didn't have a broad general uh, education, but that he knew construction <laughs> because he, they hired him. And he designed this house, which is now a landmark in Berlin. And the next picture um, is uh, the view from down the, the slope. It's sort of a site that you have several over here in uh, a ravine almost. And the garden goes down the slope. It's a dramatic house, very traditional, but well built and very proportioned, nicely proportioned. And the next picture shows the architect at age 22 standing at the entrance of the house with cigar in hand. <laughs> uh, he started that, uh, shall we say, vice early in his life. <laughs> um, he also met my grandmother there socially and he said they had parties in the house and it was, and, and he had to buy a tuxedo or a, a, a ta but tails of a, a black suit tied with tails. They, they were very formal in those years still. And he said it was like going to an ice skating rink. You had to slide elegantly on the, on the polished parquet floors, you know. Um, and Professor Real re realized that Mies was interested, was talented, and had a curiosity, but didn't have received the proper education. So he said, you should go to Italy and one day to Greece uh, uh, and paid, paid for a trip for him to go to Italy. And he went and went to Rome and um, Florence and saw Italy, um, and he said, well, I stayed there a month or so and looked at everything, and it was very, very impressive um, but until I got homesick for the clouded skies <laughs> <laughs> of the north. 
because Aachen, uh, Germany is much further north, and there you have days like we had today, <laughs> quite a bit. Um, the next house is uh, a very famous house today, even called the Orbik House. Orbik was the president of the, uh, the I think, the Deutsche Bank or Dresdner Bank, one of the big banks in uh, Germany at the time, and they wanted a big house. And th this is the design that the young niece did. And what's interesting to me, uh, I've been in it after the World War II when it was sort of half, uh, it wasn't destroyed, but it was not cared for for many years. Um, however, during the Potsdam Conference, because it's not far from where the Potsdam Conference in 1945 took place, Churchill stayed in this house. It was the residence of the British Prime Minister. And there is a famous picture, some of you may have seen it, where Stalin, Truman, and Churchill sit on that terrace there um, uh, during the Potsdam Conference. Today, the house uh, has been bought by, I don't know his name, um, uh, the owner of the German uh, computer company, is sort of like the, the equivalent of a smaller Apple company. And he restored it very uh, precisely and carefully. And it's, it's a beautiful villa of that, it's about 100 years old now. This was all still before World War I. Then, of course, came the war. Mies was drafted as a young man, and I know he spent some time during the war in uh, Romania and, and uh, that part of the world. Um, but um, afterwards, in, in Berlin, very quickly, the mood and the interest of artistic people changed rapidly and modernism became, uh, was growing and people said we can't do 19th century buildings anymore or art for that matter. And Berlin became a, a real uh, uh, birthplace and, and, and shall we say a hotbed of, of new innovative ideas in art and architecture and in theater and in dance. And uh, there, were, there were people constantly inventing new things. And Mies decided also that he needed to uh, change his direction and not build fancy big villas like the one you just saw. And there was a competition held for a uh, tall building to be erected at the uh, Bahnhof Friedrichstraße. Bahnhof means railroad station, er, uh, city railroad, the, the elevated trains would come through there. And it's on Friedrichstraße, which later during, after World War II, was right where the border between East and West Berlin was. And um, uh, he created this glassy building, um, that you, well, you see already the next picture, the rounded one, that's the second building. But the one that you saw before was had sharp pointed corners. Uh, all glass building, 20 stories high, totally unrealizable at the time because the industry couldn't do something like that. But it was a vision that he had. And it was widely published and noted and made him know literally overnight as a modern architect and thinker. Uh, and uh, even some of, and, and then in the following years, um, he developed several other buildings for that same site out of interest. He did it on his own and no client paid him for that. And this building here that you see here is interesting 
because it had a tremendous influence on a building in Chicago called Lake Point Tower, which was created, designed by two students of Mies. He, he was their professor at IIT, Illinois Institute of Technology, uh, in the post-war years, and this building was built in the early 50s. Um, and it's still there today. It's right on Lake, Front, Lake, Lake Michigan, overlooking the lake, and in the other direction, the city, the whole skyline, everything, from every one of these apartments. It's a tremendous, uh, uh, successful building, uh, and obviously much influenced by Mises' 1921 vision of this building on the left picture. Well, I already mentioned that he knew how to draw. He was very good at sketching some of his ideas. And here's a sketch of a villa. You see a lake in the distance and a sailboat even. And a sculpture, he loved to put place art of, he, he was familiar with recently created art and he knew some of the artists personally. And um, uh, the, uh, so the, this, I, I show this only to show that that was the method at that time, how architects would show their clients what they're thinking, what they want to do, what the concept is. Um, and um, because of his ability to do that very well, um, I think that's got him a few jobs over, over time from, from his sketches. Uh, he was a very serious man who was constantly trying to learn more and study more. He had a, a growing collection of philosophical works in his library. And um, uh, I think of him as a philosopher architect. He had very serious thoughts about everything. And he decided in those years of the 20s and into the 30s to analyze the 20th century and what is significant about it. And he came to the conclusions that the development of technology uh, is, is the essence of modern life in the 20th century. And that's why he was uh, interested in uh, designing and employing latest technology such as glass, steel, even concrete, and expressing that as a new way of looking at built environment. And uh, in, the, in the years that he lived in Berlin, interestingly enough, I find that always amazing, he was 30, 30 years in Berlin, lived in one place all the time, practically. And um, uh, his office was rel very, very relatively small. And he built a few buildings, really, and none of them big. The Barcelona Pavilion, the Tugendhat House, and um, uh, uh, another house, uh, modern house in Berlin, but, but small, very small. 30s. Um, in other words, he was a Berlin architect, but had nothing to show really much in that city. He comes to Chicago, and within 10, 10, 15 years, the city is full of his buildings. We have in Chicago lots of major Mies buildings. Um, it's, it's very interesting how that, uh, how that changed for him. And of course, he had no idea this would go that way. Uh, and that's not why he came to Chicago, because he couldn't expect it. In fact, he didn't even speak English when he came. He was 52 years old when he arrived in Chicago and um, needed to study the language. He went to the Berlitz School of uh, Speaking uh, English, and he was very frustrated with his teachers there because they always said, just say it, just, just do it. And he said, well, I want to know what the structure is. 
how it's constructed, the word, the sentence, and so on. Now, the, the picture you see here is the famous Tugendhat house. Uh, by the way, the word Tugendhat uh, is, is, uh, means, Tugend is virtue, and Hat means has. Uh, it's a name, but uh, it's, it's a beautiful name that the, the, the owner or the carrier of that name has virtue. And <laughs> I sort of think that's appropriate for the Tugendhat family because they decided to hire me uh, through some connections in Berlin uh, for this villa in Brno, B-R-N-O, in the Czech Republic. At the time, uh, it's just north of Vienna, not far from Vienna, uh, and on the way to Prague, uh, the, the, in industrial city. And the Tugendhats were industrialists, the family, and um, uh, it's a fairly sizable villa on a sloping site. And uh, what I saw today on our wonderful tour through Washington, there are lots of sites here that have slopes and are on hills, and this is very much the same situation here. And it's a, it's a house where you enter on the street level, which is high. And then you take the stair down to the main floor, the opposite of what's normally done. Um, and the next picture, you see the inside of the living area, very famous picture of uh, his furniture designs and uh, the drapes on the glass wall. The glass wall, by the way, is also very, very interesting because it was, as far as I know, the pretty much the first time that somebody had constructed these large windows from ceiling to floor could be push a button and they would sink down into the basement. And in and, uh, and a nice warm summer day, these windows would be lowered and the living room became like a terrace that had a roof over it, but um, dramatic. And um, the, you see in the dis distant, that dark wooden wall that's a round enclosure of the dining table. The dining table is a uh, also a custom designed round table for small groups and very large groups. You could expand it with curved sections, like you can extend dining tables, but applied to a round shape makes it unique. And then he designed, of course, um, also not, not by a commission from their owners, but because he wanted to he saw the need for some furniture that was appropriate for this new modern architecture, and th that furniture didn't exist in his opinion, and he, he asked if he could design something, have it fabricated, manufactured, uh, deliver it to the house and install it in the house, and if they didn't like it, he would remove it and take it back, because the husband didn't want that really but they agreed to let him do that, and that's what you see here. And as far as I know, it pretty much stayed in place <laughs> after they, they saw it and experienced it. And the, the Tugendhat chair is not here, but it's a similar to the so-called Barcelona chair. It's a metal frame with leather cushions, but it has a different frame underneath, uh, which allows the chair to swing nicely, and it's actually more comfortable than the Barcelona chair. That one was designed for the Spanish king for the opening of the World's Fair in, in, uh, in uh, Barcelona in 1929. The Tugendhat house was at the same time. Thanks. I gotta move. This is the Barcelona pavilion in Barcelona. All of you, or most of you, know about it. Uh, it was uh, dismantled after the exhibition, but it was published worldwide. It made him famous. Just this one little pavilion. 
and uh, he also became known now gradually, bit by bit, in America through American modern, new archit younger architects. And um, it was dismantled after the exhibition. And then in the 50s, 60s, um, a group of Barcelona architects wanted to rebuild it. And MoMA was involved, I was involved. And uh, the building was rebuilt and is as beautiful as the original one. And it's now a great attraction. I know some of you have been there. Um, It's also what's interesting, the, 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 the flag, the German flag at the time, it was the national pavilion of Germany at the World's Fair in, in Barcelona. And the colors were what they now are, the, because that was the Weimar Republic, um, uh, black, red, and gold, those three colors. And there is no symbol that is obvious However, the, when you look at the colors of the stones in the building and the onyx walls and the f flooring and so on, he used these colors in, a, in, the, in the building materials. So it uh, be became the flag of the country in the materials. I find that an interesting idea. And I, I think most people don't even realize that. But that's, uh, and his, he was, uh, had a collaborator on this work with Lily Reich, a woman interior designer, very talented, that collaborated with him for several years before he emigrated to the United States. Um, she has now in recent years been, become also famous and has been studied and published again uh, for her works in the 20s and 30s. Um, next. The Barcelona Pavilion here with a sculpture. He loved sculptures, as you already saw. And these are all artists that he knew personally. Next. Yeah, this is how what he looked like in those years in the 30s. Um, uh, approaching 50 or around 50 years of age. Uh, and I would, I don't know exactly how old, the, the, when, what, the, what, what the age he had when this picture was taken, but I would say it is in the years that he came to America. Uh, so about that, he looks energetic, um, strong, and um, he decides after 33, no, he didn't, doesn't decide, they decided, the Nazis decided that modern architecture is what they don't want, and um, he didn't get any more commissions at all. And he lived from 33 to 38 when he finally le left, in other words, five years, supported himself with the fees for the furniture designs, which were still being manufactured here and there. Um, so he was uh, pretty much out of luck at that time and didn't have much money at all. He comes to Chicago and has to learn English. <laughs> and, um, but he was uh, offered the position of deanship or directorship of the College of Architecture at the Illinois Institute of Technology. And he, they gave him also amazing to me. Uh, his, his a German doesn't even speak English during the war. And they gave him a, the, the master planning commission for the campus. And that's what the first things he worked on. And there's an interesting little story that over the years has become known that uh, in the very beginning, after he got to Chicago and they had asked him to take a look at designing a campus, uh, a whole area in the city of Chicago, um, he goes with uh, Ludwig Hilbersheimer, another Bauhaus uh, uh, city planning guy, uh, and Lily Reich was, had come to visit 
um, for a few weeks. And they went to Wisconsin on a little lake and spent some days there and had rolled out large drawings of the area that needed to be planned for, for the IIT. And uh, a waiter in, in the, the restaurant there um, uh, tried to figure out what's going on. These people with plans, what are they planning? They are German, my God. <laughs> Uh, and he reported it to the FBI, <laughs> and a, 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 a portfolio or a, was was started in, in the FBI about Mies van der Rohe. Nothing ever happened. He was never contacted by them. In the in the nineties, some journalist that writes about architecture in Chicago, uh, by Freedom of Information Act. Uh, requested this portfolio or the file on Mies van der Rohe, and it was a sizable thing with all kinds of reports in it, but uh, nothing ever done that <laughs> warranted the pursuit of the, the uh, uh, of Mies. Um, so the the, uh, the you see here this picture is uh, also interesting to me. This is what Chicago looked like when he came to Chicago. Um, the lakefront was to s some degree already a little bit developed, but not yet the way it is now. Um, it was all in the making. And you, you heard of uh, Burnham's plan for Chicago, 1909. Um, they implemented that um, bit by bit, here and there a little bit, and we're still doing it now. In other words, there's still, whenever something major has to be done in Chicago, we talk about the Burnham plan, because that is the, the master plan for the city of Chicago on the lakefront. And it was modeled after Paris, which of course was uh, not unlike Washington DC, where all the buildings more or less had the same height. That's what Burnham had in mind. He, well, he did not convince the <laughs> the developers in <laughs> the city of Chicago to stop high-rise buildings. They, they mushroomed rather rapidly. Next. Oh, well, we don't need to talk about the Barcelona chairs. Um, uh, that we don't need to do that either. Oh, by the way, I'm just realizing something. I just saw something. I, this is not even the, the final version of the, the slides. I edited them since then. So let's, let's forget this, go on. <laughs> uh, one of the well-known buildings is, is uh, Crown Hall in Chicago at IIT is the architecture school, which is uh, one column free space. About, if you took all these columns out, that would be about Crown Hall in size, in scale, one hall, where the architects sit the first year there and the second year and so on. Very open space. Uh, when I went there in 1957, in my first year, um, the, uh, they had a homecoming dance at the university in Crown Hall. And uh, I had never experienced that. They don't have that in German universities. So, um, uh, and uh, I asked Mies if he wanted to come and he was my date. So <laughs> we, we went there and uh, there were uh, the students all nicely dressed up and Duke Ellington Orchestra was playing for the dance. And the Duke had heard that the architect of the building was in the audience and somebody came and asked me to talk to Duke Ellington. And Duke Ellington told him that the acoustics are perfect, <laughs> just perfect for his music, and he likes it very much. And Mies was so proud that, because he believed in the, the multi-purpose of space. In other words, that space doesn't have to be just designed and made for one thing to do. 
You can do all kinds of things and change it. Have lectures, dinners, dances, exhibitions. All of that happened in Crown Hall and is still being used today that way. And it's that flexibility of his work, which I think is also evident in this building here uh, and how easy and how well it was renovated and updated. Um, uh, so that's, that's one of the features of Mises' work. Next. Well, that's the, how Crown Hall looked in those days, rather, rather hall-like. Today it's much more crowded. I, I have to rush a little bit to catch up. Um, yeah, that's how it's built. It's the framework of it. And you see these big girders, the deep beams going over the roof. They made it make it possible not to have columns on the inside to support the roof. That's girders that go over the roof. It's exposed steel construction. It's a wonderful building and greatly admired in Chicago. Next. What do I see now? Farnsworth House. Oh, yeah. That was done at the same time and um, uh, for Edith Farnsworth. It now was, it's now, uh, was renamed officially as Edith Farnsworth House just this year. And uh, it's outside Chicago, a little bit hard to get to because it's an hour, or hour to an hour and a half drive in the, the country. Uh, but uh, people come from around the world. And uh, I remember in 1957 when I came to Chicago, I wanted to see that house because I was familiar with it because of the pictures that me sent to my mother regularly about his buildings and his work. And that's how probably I became interested in architecture because I was exposed to all of this for years. And um, I went out there with a friend of mine and Edith Farnsworth was in the house and we didn't dare walk into the property. We stood at, on the street on a fence and looked into the property and walked around the fence and she saw us and then she took from the table binoculars <laughs> and followed us with the binoculars. And I tell you, it was like having a gun pointed at you. We never dared enter the property. <laughs> it was a wasted trip. <laughs> but later in life, I uh, was a good friend of mine, Peter Palumbo, Lord Palumbo from London, um, bought the house. Not the least of, uh, of the, on the recommendation that I made. I said, Peter, the best Mies house you could buy is the Farnsworth house. And uh, he, he did buy it and asked me to take care of it. So for years I was in charge of the house. And I furnished it and I designed some furniture, a desk and a bed and a ta dining table and so on uh, for the house. And now, right now, they have an exhibition in the house of the Palumbo years. In other words, uh, all the stuff that were in, in the house for Peter Palumbo are now visible there. And last year they had Edith Farnsworth uh, in the house. It's a, it's a great house, wonderful, not for everybody to live in. And, um, There, there are little anecdotes I could tell, but let me, let's go, keep going. So uh, in those years, keep, keep moving a little bit because I realized that the, the, the stick you have is not quite the latest version. What is this? I can't even see it. What is this? Oh, well, yeah, they, I designed it, but forget it. <laughs> um, the, um, these are the apartment buildings on Lakeshore Drive. I live in one of those buildings on the top. And um, they, they were the first steel and glass high-rise buildings, uh, really, in America uh, in 1952. Uh, 
Mies designed them, the two on the left first, and then two more on the right two years later. Uh, and there is, there's an interesting story uh, about uh, these buildings. The first two buildings didn't have central air conditioning because nobody in those, uh, in those days, developers didn't build uh, AC uh, automatically into a building. That, uh, you know, people had to buy their own window units. And of course, once they started appearing in the building, uh, Mies and the office were all shocked what that looked like. <laughs> and uh, uh, designed a special unit, which had to be put uh, in an operable window, but it was flush on the outside so that it didn't show up as, as a thing sticking out. Um, so they, that is still in use, but because I'm on the top floor of that building, uh, I have my own air conditioning on the roof, so uh, I don't have those things. <laughs> <laughs> they have, they have, they have very popular buildings and primarily with architects, <laughs> just about everybody that is a younger architect once lived in these buildings. Two minutes, okay. Yeah, can you uh, advance a little bit? Let me show you a few things of what, what I have done. Um, keep going. These are all the Federal Center in Chicago. It's a Mies building. I worked on that when I first started working in the office. This is the Berlin Museum, the new National Gallery. It's a big uh, hall, again, without columns. Next, yeah. And uh, next picture, I, I talked with some people. Oh, this is interesting. The last time Mies came to Berlin was when this roof was raised on the columns. And you see it here assembled on the ground as a big steel plate. The steel itself is seven feet thick. That's all steel. That's the roof. And the roof raising was done by the steel contractor on the day of the National Convention of the Concrete Industry, um, in, which was in the Philharmonic Hall. They met and had a meeting there. And in the morning when they, these concrete guys went in there, they saw steel lying on the ground. When they came out at the end of the day, there was a building. And <laughs> that <laughs> was to show the, advantages of steel construction. <laughs> Next. You see here uh, how it's going up. You see the column even is attached and is, is slowly rising to its vertical position. Uh, Mies decided at that time to go under the roof and see what the space would be like. And he and I, I, I drove the car to the edge and then we got out and walked a few steps under the roof and I made sure I was always standing in the void between two beams <laughs> so that when it came down I could survive. He just went there and looked and was, uh, you know, um, uh, not afraid at all. And that was his last visit in, in Berlin. So the building was opened a year later and he couldn't come. He was too old. Um, but it's now, 50 some years later, has been renovated with uh, the help of uh, uh, David Chipperfield, a British architect who has an office in, in Berlin. Very good people. Uh, I, I was a consultant to them. Um, and uh, it's, it's a very, very nice, very uh, high class, uh, renovation job uh, and uh, anybody that goes there should see it. Um, next. Yeah, the IBM building in Chicago, I won't dwell on it, it's a high-rise building that was done also at the very end of his life, in fact it was finished after his death. I worked on that building uh, and it's, um, uh, it was the first curtain wall that's thermally broken meaning it's the inner and the outer layer of the exterior wall are s separated with an insulating layer so that there is no heat or cold transfer from outside to inside. 
and um, uh, because prior to that everything was steel and glass and the temperature would migrate. Next. So just flip through some more pictures. What's this here? I can't see it. Oh, the Langham Hotel, yeah. Forget it. It's in the IBM building. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I know I have to finish next. I want to just catch, capture something. Oh, yeah, McDonald's. Um, this is the McDonald's corporate headquarters in Oak Brook outside Chicago. There was a competition held, and I was invited to participate, as so am, and fed several architects from around the nation. Um, in the in the early 70s, and uh, uh, Ray Kroc had had just retired; he was still alive, but uh, Fred Turner was the new chairman. And uh, one day, after the, uh, I got a call from Fred Turner because we had made presentations; everybody did. And uh, he said, "Can you come and see me?" I said, "When? Now." <laughs> so. I drove out to Oak Brook, and when I got to his floor and his office, there was a bottle of uh, champagne and two glasses on his table, but he wasn't there. Um, so I thought, that doesn't look bad. Um, so anyway, he said, I'd like to give you this job, but don't take advantage of McDonald's. Um, and let's not write a contract. Let's not do all this paperwork. Just, just do your work and we'll pay you. Um, and we worked for two years and made several million dollars without a piece of paper, I mean, without a contract. Uh, it was that informal and that uh, trusting, you know. And, and believe me, I took that very seriously. I made sure we, we had honest billings, you know. <laughs> Next. Uh, it's, it's, uh, the other thing he said, he said, what you did in the competition, I'm not so sure I want to have all this Miesian work, but can, you know, I really am interested in, in your work, and I'd like to have a Dirk Lohan. And um, so that's why it is a modern interpretation of the Prairie style, which is a Midwestern style that, of course, was famous with Frank Lloyd Wright. And it's brick, overhanging roofs, and so on. You keep going with the slides. Oh, I don't know what this is. This is an art museum, yes. Next, at the Northwestern University. And this is a, is this a high-rise building? It's a, what? Oh, I don't know, keep going, slowly. This is a high-rise building that I did here a few years ago. Next, that's the corner, and you see the, how the spandrels are expressed as a concave surface rather than flat to play with the light and the shadow a little bit. Um, uh, this is... Uh, I really cannot make out what I'm looking at. Uh, well, maybe I should. Uh, can you go to the end and flip flip through all the pictures quickly, and then we're done? Uh, oh yeah, my, 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 uh, Soldier Field, the football stadium. That was the biggest job I ever did. Hundreds of millions of dollars, and it was a it was a. In my opinion, a very successful project, and I would say today it is quite appreciated by Chicagoans in, in the location it is in and what it is. But at the time, there was a, quite a bit of controversy, and some of the newspapers attacked Mayor Daley and Dirk Lohan for it. <laughs> so, uh, the shed uh, Shadow Oceanarium is uh, the aquarium. Well, we did a very special uh, exhibit for whales and dolphins. Next. Keep going. Yeah, they're there. If you can see, if you see there and you see the, the pool inside the building, it overlaps 
seamlessly visually with Lake Michigan as if you're on the edge of an ocean. That was the idea, rather than have people sit all around and it's like a circus, you know, you look at, 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 the, at the pool. Next. Now that, that's, that's the great ape house at Lincoln Park Zoo. Forget it. Oh, here's a, I did, I did a couple of small houses or private houses because once in a while friends of mine asked me, can you do a house for me or whatever? And uh, this is one that I'd like to tell you a little anecdote and then we end. Um, this is in Michigan, outside Grand Rapids, in the country. And this young man called me one day and said, uh, uh, I was, rec uh, Philip, I called Philip Johnson and uh, he said I should call, talk to you. Because I called him and asked him if he would design me a Miss Van Der Rohe house. <laughs> And um, told him, uh, young man, I, sorry, I don't do Mies van der houses anymore. <laughs> Why don't you call his grandson Dirk Lohan in Chicago? He may do that. So he, that's what he told me. And I said, well, I don't do Mies van der houses either anymore. <laughs> I'll do you a Dirk Lohan house. And he hired me. See, sometimes it's good to be bold. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what you see here. It's actually a square Rubik cube, as high, as wide, as deep, everything is square plate. And it's a, it's a spiral uh, stair arrangement inside the house to go up. And the, the terrace and the roof, uh, the porch, so to say, is on top of the house. And one day he called me after it was finished. And um, he said, we had uh, a great party outside on the roof with barbecue and this and that. And I have to give you a, a, a real compliment because there are no mosquitoes up there. <laughs> um, and uh, you are a genius. <laughs> I said, thank you very much. And I took the, the compliment but I, I tell you, I had no idea. <laughs> but now I know that when you build higher, the mosquitoes don't go everywhere. <laughs> so with that, that's not a Mies lesson, but that's a lesson from life. And uh, uh, I thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. The toast. <laughs> this is, let's give this toast to the architect of your wonderful library and to my mentor and grandfather and all of you who seem to appreciate his work. Thank you very much. Um, folks, uh, we unfortunately don't have time for Q&A tonight because uh, the library is closed and we should have been out here a few minutes ago, but I can talk to the boss and probably straighten things out. Um, Dirk, thank you. That was incredible. Um, thank you so much for, I, I wish we would have started it. You I know, didn't really get 3 into PM. my stuff, but it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you come back, we can do it again. Yeah. And that would be wonderful. Um, Uh, folks, this presentation will be up on the library's YouTube channel, so uh, encourage your friends who may have missed this and are interested to see this uh, tomorrow and forever after that. Um, we are working at the library. You may have heard some of you uh, who are outside for the reception. Uh, we are working on a Mies exhibition in this building, and we would love for any of you who are interested in helping us out to contact me, rrg at dc.gov, and we can uh, talk to you about what we're thinking about and I want to thank the DC Public Library Foundation for spearheading that and for the reception uh, from before. Thank you all for coming. Enjoy the rest of your night and enjoy your long weekend. Thank you. Thank you so much.
so much. I'm so sorry. I had to rush you. Thank you. It's fine. No, I feel fine. I think it's fine. Yeah, it was great. No, it was wonderful. It's really fine because the, the means stuff is, was more or less finished.